Well, this paper begins with what must have been one of the first field surveys, the early medieval poem called Tara, Noblest of Hills. It belonged to a distinctive genre known as Dinshenakas, which described the traditions associated with Irish place names. These accounts referred to a series of ancient monuments and explained their relationship to one another on the ground. They were so precise that a 19th century scholar was able to identify the various structures on the hill of Tara, and here is his reconstruction. But that does not explain the character of the original exercise. Like archaeologists today, its authors interpreted what they saw in relation to a distant past. It raises some important questions. How old were those monuments when they were described? Did any of them still remain in use? Were the accounts preserved in the Shedin Shenakas an accurate reflection of the original character of these structures? And why was it important to remember it? The last question is the, is the easiest to answer. Tara had long been considered as the seat of kings, a place which was used for public assemblies and the inauguration of rulers. For a while, it was controlled by the southern O'Neills, but by the 11th century AD, their influence was in decline. By emphasising the significance of the hill, the court poet could advance their claims to a distinguished history. When the Dinshenakas was composed, the hilltop might even have been deserted, and elite residences and Christian churches were already established in the surrounding countryside. Tara featured a series of ancient monuments, just as it does today. The Dinshenakas interpreted the remains on the hill of Tara in relation to the historical narrative preserved in the Ulster Cycle and similar texts. And here we see the cattle raid of Cooley the Toyne. Taken together, they provided an origin myth for Irish society. The actual age of these tales has been disputed, and different authorities have suggested they refer to any time between the pre-Roman Iron Age and the Viking period. By associating the Hill of Tara with the O'Neill's political agenda, the Dinshenakas emphasised the antiquity of the surviving monuments. Excavation has shown that some of them do date from the Iron Age, with an emphasis on the period between 100 BC and AD 350. Others were even older and were reused at that time. At Tara, there is no certainty that building continued much further into the first millennium, but it does seem to have happened elsewhere. Of course, Tara might have been used for inaugurations and assemblies as the texts suggest, that those activities could have taken place at ancient earthworks rather than new constructions. The earliest literary sources present another problem, and this is illustrated by two new books which discuss the same material. The first is John Waddell's Archaeology and Celtic Myth, and the other is Jim Mallory's study In Search of the Irish Dreamtime. At first sight, they arrive at different conclusions but the contrast between them identifies some points of interest. One of Waddell's concerns is the ancient cosmos. He considers the notion of an underworld and the movements of the sun. In addition to the Irish text, he draws on the iconography of Celtic art and the reuse of megalithic tombs like the Grave Mound of the Hostages, which you see top right. He places a special emphasis on the study of votive deposits, especially the Roman Iron Age material, especially the Roman Iron Age valuables from the Neolithic monument at Newgrange, which traditional sources claimed as a dwelling of the gods. By contrast, Mallory focuses on the details of the buildings, fortifications, and artifacts described in the Ulster cycle. They were very different from those of the Iron Age but some of them resemble features of the Viking Age. One reason why they've been dated to an earlier period is that the texts quoted from Roman sources in the Bible, but they would have been familiar when the stories were written down. In fact, the strongest link with an ancient past 
was the sighting of the royal centres mentioned in these accounts. Excavation provides direct evidence that they were established during the pre-Roman and Roman Iron Ages. Tara is just one example of a wider phenomenon in Ireland. How can these accounts be reconciled with one another? They describe very different features. For Waddell, it was long-standing beliefs about the supernatural and the cosmos that were most resilient. Mallory shows that the texts include elements from the familiar world, no matter how concerned their authors were to set their accounts in the past. Does this mean that certain elements retained their significance for a longer time than others? When the texts were committed to writing, they described events in the past that endorsed political manoeuvres in the present. While certain concepts might have retained their importance for centuries, these accounts included elements that would have been understood because they were consistent with the experience of an early medieval audience. It's clear that the royal centres of the Ulster cycle did play a role in the Iron Age, but their character is very different from the descriptions of them in the written sources. That was not because people intended to falsify the past. The truth is that many of its elements were beyond recall. The first attempts to write a history of Ireland provided a mythical charter for the kings of Tara and drew on what evidence was still available. It did include ancient monuments, but the details of these places have been lost. The work of Mallory and Waddell suggests that some things were forgotten more readily than others. The details of settlements and artefacts were the most vulnerable elements and the first to be revised as these stories were performed. These features had to be updated so that it could be understood by the audience. And in Ireland, this process reached its conclusion during the early medieval period. On the other hand, certain places were still respected, although little was known about how they had been used. The remains of ancient monuments could be identified on the ground, as they were here at Tara. The Din Shenikas illustrate many of these elements. It focused on a series of distinctive features at Tara. There were earthwork enclosures which could still be recognised. And there were the remains of other sto structures built out of flagstones. They were interpreted as graves. <coughs> Mounds also features in these accounts. All these elements were visible, but of unknown age. The Dinshenikas also referred to natural features and processes that were difficult to explain. In the case of Tara, they were, they were a rock outcrop, springs, streams, and a marsh. They could possess a special significance because metalwork was deposited in similar locations. The same applies to wells like the legendary source of the River Boyne. Other examples include caves that communicated with the other world and ruined megalithic tombs. Certain structures may have been organised according to celestial alignments, and that's certainly true of Newgrange. None of these relationships involve the workings of memory, for too much information had been lost over the course of time. A more appropriate term is commemoration, which can be characterised as human activity undertaken in response to a past. This might involve an act of interpretation, but its historical accuracy was not the critical factor. Instead, it has to be understood in its social context. To the return to the Dijenikas, the earliest accounts of Tara drew on what could be seen there, but they were intended to endorse the claims of the Southern Ideals. Now, can we take a similar approach to the prehistoric period? Now, to my embarrassment, we're all talking about the Avebury area. We started there and we will end there. This was not planned, um, but there is no contradiction between the two papers, and I like what you said this morning, and I hope you might be converted by what I say too. <laughs> so can we take a similar approach to the prehistoric period? The River Kennet is the principal territory of the Thames, and is notable for its abundance of prehistoric monuments around its source. It rises close to Avebury, where the water emerges seasonally from the chalk, as it does here. One spring, the Swallowhead Spring, that rarely dries up is in the shadow of Silbury Hill, the largest prehistoric mound in Europe. There were other structures nearby whose history spanned four millennia. 
They include the well-known chambered tomb, West Connaught Long Barrow, a series of palisaded enclosures, and an important late Neolithic settlement. And the longer version of this paper, you also get an Iron Age sanctuary, a Roman town, and Viking burial, but you can't have that because I've got 20 minutes. <laughs> How are their histories related to one another? The oldest monument in this group preserves the longest sequence, and the history of that site can be related to most of the developments in the surrounding area. The West Kennet Longbar is a chambered tomb set in one end of a trapezoidal mound. One chamber was excavated during the 19th century, but four others remained intact until they were investigated in the 1950s. Originally, they contained at least 36 individuals whose bodies had been placed there over about 50 years. The primary deposits may date from the 13th, 37th century BC. Certain details of the earthwork are particularly relevant to this account. Like similar structures, it faced the position of the morning sun. But in this case, its long axis was also directed down the valley of the River Kennet as it flowed towards its confluence with the Thames, 60 kilometres to the east. The alignment of the monument must have been important, as the mound seems to have been lengthened during the secondary phase. There's the original, there's the rest, and it is only an interpretation, but I put money on it. <laughs> the alignment of the monument must have been important then, as it seems to be lengthened during the secondary phase. The connection between the monument and the river assumed even great more importance during subsequent phases. The dating programme undertaken at the monument had two unexpected results. The first was that this massive structure was used for only half a century before the tomb was closed. The other is that it was brought back into use after a period of abandonment that could have lasted 300 years. Then, over almost a millennium, the chambers were filled with a series of deposits that included inhumation burials, disarticulated human bone, cremations, fawn remains, and a selection of artefacts. It was about, this, about the time that the tomb was reused that two palisaded enclosures were built on the lower ground overlooked by the barrow. That's up there. New dates show that they were constructed between 3300 and 3200 BC. There were obvious connections with the previous history of the site. One of the enclosures spanned the Kennet, and its neighbour may have done the same. They took in a section of the river only 500 metres downstream from a Swallowhead Spring. Few artefacts were associated with either of these structures, and any material that had accumulated on these sites must have been taken away. Perhaps it was deposited inside the older tomb, which may have been reopened for the purpose. As well as food remains, it contained a series of lavishly decorated vessels. At the same time, additional bodies were placed inside the tomb, but the primary deposits remained intact. Radiocarbon dating has confirmed that those in the secondary filling were more recent than the original burials. So by the end of the fourth millennium BC, the enclosures had gone out of use, but the tomb still continued to receive special deposits. It retained its importance as new developments happened in the surrounding area. The first was the reuse of the sites of the Palisadian enclosures by people who employed a new ceramic style, grooved ware, which is often associated with the ceremonial centres of the late Neolithic. A settlement developed on the site and produced an assemblage of animal bones, which were probably the remains of feasts. The settlement occupied exactly the same position as the timber enclosures, although little trace of the abandoned monument could have been recognised on the ground. Artifacts contemporary with the reuse of that site were placed inside the long barrow. The late Neolithic settlement was contemporary with an even more impressive monument, Silbury Hill itself. It changed its form in the course of construction, starting as a circular enclosure bounded by a mangan ditch. It had a central mound which grew to enormous proportions over a surprisingly short period of time. Although it was associated with few prehistoric artefacts, 
Its creation seems to have spanned the period between about 2500 and 2400 BC. Like the long barrow, which remained a conspicuous feature on the horizon, it overlooked the spring that was the principal source of the Kennet. Still more important, it was bounded by a ditch which can still hold water today. On one side, it was enlarged to create an enormous pool. Anyone standing on the mound commands an impressive view over the surrounding area. This remarkable sequence ended with the first appearance of bell beakers and metalwork in southern Britain. It seems likely that this phase saw significant developments in the composition of a local population, and it's possible that the construction of enormous monuments was one way of reasserting traditional norms in the face of sudden change. It was then that the construction of monuments at West Kennet came to an end. At the Long Barrow it happened when decorated beaker vessels were placed inside the monument during the late 3rd millennium BC. Now how should these in developments be interpreted? Perhaps some lessons can be learned from the history of Tara. Certain questions seem particularly important. Would the remains of older structures have been comprehensible to a later audience? West Kennet Long Barrow belonged to a well-researched architectural tradition. It's unlikely that similar structures were being built in the region by the late 4th millennium BC, but this was the period when the entrances of other tombs were being closed. It means that they would have been familiar at the time when the West Kennet Long Barrow was brought back into use. The building of such a structure <coughs> could have been understood when the palisaded enclosures encircled the course of the river. And this may be why the deposition of human remains resumed. A second question is whether the successive structures at West Kennet were associated with natural features or processes that might have retained their significance over a long period of time. The most important must have been the presence of the river. It was a principal tributary of the Thames and was certainly associated with a range of special monuments. The West Kennet complex has two distinctive characteristics. It includes a swallowhead print, a spring, which provides a dependable source of water through much of the year. Both the enclosure and the ditch around Westman, uh, Silbury Hill drew on this association. The emergence of fresh water from underground would have been difficult to explain, and that could be why springs were equally important at the Irish Royal Centres. A second reason that the carrot remains significant might be that its water travels in the direction of the rising sun. These features remained the same throughout the entire sequence. The last question suggested by the archaeology of Tara is whether there were periods when political developments encouraged people to emphasise their pasts. The argument could apply to the building of Silbury Hill at another time when the occupants of southern England were exposed to unfamiliar people, practices and beliefs. Now, there's a beaker, and given it's a theoretical context of conference, I have no excuse for putting on the wrong sort of beaker. It's not, <laughs> pretend it's a very early beaker, or since it's tag, it doesn't particularly matter. <laughs> but the ones that I couldn't find a picture of are early beakers, and that one isn't, and it doesn't come from there, it comes from Yorkshire. Just details. <laughs> Towards the middle of the third millennium BC, Enormous monuments of entirely insular forms were constructed or reconstructed. A building like Stonehenge consumed a huge amount of human labour, yet many of those monuments were remarkably short-lived. After a period that might have been less than a century, some of them provided a focus for bellbeak graves. Others were modified and probably used in new ways. It's tempting to suggest that the sighting of Silbury Hill was an attempt to harness the power of the past in order to strengthen a society that was losing its cohesion. Little was shared between the present and the past, but in each case it was important to form a connection. A few elements may have been especially tenacious, but any link was slender and for that reason was easy to exploit. The new practices at ancient st structures may have commemorated a distinctive and mysterious history but it's most unlikely that it was recalled with any accuracy. In Wessex, as in ancient Ireland, the reuse of older monuments was a creative act, 
If the histories of such places were represented as memories, that was either a fabrication or an illusion. When people look back across an enormous expansion of time, it's likely that they were remembering things that had never happened. Thank you. Thank you.